and then Hi, Matt. Hi. How are you? Uh, I'm well. Did a little bit of a PC lab in the last day or so with the kids. One of them had to finish a PC build, so it got a little bit nerdy last night. <laughs> what did you do? Uh, you work with Raspberry Pi, or are you? No. Um, a little earlier this year, there's four kids in the house, and so we got them all like like tiny little boards, you know, with a Ryzen three thousand like, you know, kind of cheap. And um, I think it'll be like a four node house cluster, like when they're not around, but that's just a dream. Really, they're playing games. And doing <laughs> <laughs> I like Hi. to think you have something else, but. Hi, Alita. Hey. No, so, so I, I, try, I tried to do the same thing. I, 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 but it was quite too, too, uh, too young. Uh, they were, I, I did some, uh, Build some uh, recipe pie with a lot of electronic components. Hey, we're gonna do a LED. Uh, we're gonna do a LED display with a. Here is a. Let's work together. And then, after two minutes, I was going to uh, prepare the the, the the circuit when you put all the various electronic components. And I just looked at my kids and they were looking at me and say, "Okay, maybe maybe you need more 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 school." <laughs> uh, I know. I was like, I was like, look, we got all these components. Let's build these computers. It's gonna be so fun. And they were just like. You're so old. Yeah. <laughs> I want a PC. Just oh. hand me a laptop. That's it. I'm like, but but more memory, more cores. I'm like, but I don't care. <laughs> Gee, I thought we were all very excited by the Raspberry Pi's even. <laughs> so, how to build Linux supercomputers with Raspberry Pi? <laughs> Oh, this might right. be, this I think might be. I think we have Ryan uh, from my team, but um, uh, I think it's it's a uh, let's let's kind of see what we have on the on the yeah. agenda and also discuss maybe you know some of the areas we want to cover because then we can uh, you know get in some of the other projects to come and provide updates. Yeah, I know uh, Ken Finnegan just got back from vacation, so he's he, he's out today. Um, and it's the tail end of July. So I think we're at like the time when the most people are not either online or here. Yes, and probably uh, the first couple of weeks of um, August because, you know, folks are out. Um, I, I guess we can open. Uh, I'm sorry, what? No, we have, have Kevin also joined in, just joined in. So that's Oh, cool. yeah, I was just going to re-put the link. So I'm putting the link in the chat. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is... Uh, Tag Observability, second meeting of the month, uh, second Tuesday. Uh, this is a CNCF sponsored event, so please don't do anything that would be in violation of the code of conduct. Uh, so with that, I I did seed uh, the agenda with a couple of just newsworthy notes, if nothing else, that I could plow through probably extremely quickly. And we have most of the, the agenda and the time open. Um, so maybe we could kind of, uh, as Alalita, uh, mentioned, but um, oh, I forgot to put in the docs. If somebody already has them, uh, otherwise I will put them in. But uh, you know, there has been some movement around the hotel profiling uh, effort to add a new signal. Um, Ryan is actually getting on a plane right now, or else he would be here as well. Um, uh, and for the meeting coming up this Thursday, the topic uh, that was raised by folks that they wanted to chat about this week. Uh, was, um, you know, who actually benefits from a consistent, consolidated profiling open telemetry format. Um, uh, so, and in previous weeks, we've gone through um, the various profiling formats, as well as some discussion around what it might look like or, or what, it, what it could look like. Um, there's some substantive discussions in hotel profiles. I've put out some ideas as well. Um, around what this could look like from an architecture perspective uh, and an overall design perspective. Um, and, and, and the short of it, and we haven't really talked about it at length in that group and I don't run it or anything, but uh, uh, I do think that finding kind of one profiling format to rule them all is uh, a 
hard sell, right? Whereas if, if, if we took a different approach that was a little more open with regards to the actual transport, but did agree on the data model, um, uh, you know, anyway, so I'll just highlight there, there's active discussions and it's pretty, pretty nascent. Um, from the TOC and the CNCF side, Tag Contributor Strategy has just put out an email template uh, that could be used uh, uh, by, you know, once projects do their annual sandbox review, uh, you know, uh, that the, a template the TOC or a Tag could use to reach out to that project and say, hey, you've just had your review, there was some feedback, here are some next steps. Um, it reminded me that we have, I think, issue number 80. <laughs> Uh, which uh, Dominic Blue started working on, but uh, he's now in Australia working a job. Um, Matt, uh, can you share the, the, it's in the screen? Oh, sure. This is all in the notes. Uh, all the links are in the notes. I can share a screen if you like, though. Um, just a moment. Yeah, it might be just easier to, for folks to kind of. Oh, on. sure. Yeah, I, I, I always have it up, but um, I will share my screen. That's a really good idea. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, the issue I was talking about was issue number 80, mm -hmm. um, which is just uh, something for us to form an annual sandbox review. Like the yep. observability and analytics section has been growing rapidly. Yep. And, you know, minimally, this would be like a timeline with when they join the sandbox and when their annual, annual reviews are so that we can, ahead of those annual review deadlines, reach out to those projects, make sure they're okay for the ones that are in the observability space. Um, so I, I didn't want to dwell too much, but just put it on people's uh, radar that it's there. Um, uh, there's another work stream that was sort of stalled. It happened right around KubeCon and, and we basically just took a month break, but it's around uh, building out uh, personas. Um, and, and if there's anything specific to practitioners uh, of observability stuff. Um, uh, so also some links for potential future future work. Uh, and we'll be, I'll be sending out a, um, a doodle uh, to the Cloud Native Personas channel. Uh, a bunch of people identified as being interested in working on this or having worked on this in their day jobs with stuff to contribute. So uh, it's more just an FYI. Um, and then uh, I'm happy to not talk about this at all, but I wanted to have it in the notes. I've made some progress on the landscape graph uh, project. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and the link I put there is a TLDR link that if folks, so, so we, we'd had, uh, let's see, this is, this is like the wrapper issue to actually make a GraphQL endpoint. Um, so without uh, delving too deep in, long and short of it is GraphQL is a nice typed uh, interface definition language that supports inheritance and you know, interfaces and unions and, and all kinds of other custom types. Uh, and the integration between Neo4j graph database and GraphQL is great. Uh, since we've started this project, um, uh, Apollo, which is in roughly 90% of, of all GraphQL server implementations that are kind of out there um, in force, at least that's the number, <laughs> number I read, um, they've released what they call Federation 2.0. So it's a, and they've released a bunch more of this as open source versus an enterprise offering. In addition, they've released a router. So we have our first contributor that popped up and started asking all kinds of questions, you know, about how are we going to, you know, the different ways we could do schemas and, and whatnot and some of the issues. Um, I've responded here and I'll be following up in the next week or so with some more serious docs. But um, this is basically a link trove for anyone interested in GraphQL, uh, 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 graph databases, and this landscape graph project generally. Um, uh, I've collated some of the some of the more relevant documentation and work around what uh, supergraphs and subgraphs are, what schema composition is, et cetera. Um, in addition, there's a nice demo app that we can check out. And, uh, um, and then some other links about just kind of what's going on uh, with this with this project, which is a lot of a lot of good stuff. I mention it here and it's relevant for tag observability uh, because as we you know look to quantify what's going on in our slice of the ecosystem, which is a pretty significant slice, um, you know, having the ability to kind of have dynamically generated uh, charts and graphs and, 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 and being able to understand who's contributing to what, who's funding those contributors, what projects are growing or shrinking, what projects might need help or what projects might need help in the future based on what we know now. So all of these kinds of questions 
um, are, are part of the motivation, at least for our persona or others uh, for this project. So yeah, um, and then this is really very cool. I think it's very helpful for, um, you know, just long term looking at the growth and uh, considerations for each project. So yeah, really exciting stuff. Yeah, the um, the the thing I'll mention, uh, I think it's issue 54. Up something like that. Um, yeah, so it turns out that I had done this way back in April, this notion of subgraph modules. And without reading all this, you can kind of see like if we had these sorts of modules um, that were independent, independently testable, independently CIable, if you will, uh, you end up with something that kind of looks like this. SGM is subgraph module, right? So we want to not have a monolithic schema, uh, you know, many, many good practices uh, and, and whatnot. Um, uh, kind of have a lot of the problems of doing it that way. Uh, so I had come up with and started to design a way to modularize the graphs so that different teams or people could work on different pieces and not break each other. Um, uh, what Apollo Federation uh, does uh, is specifically provide a really well-formed way to do exactly this. So for example, you know, something in one part of the graph can use a type defined in another or can even extend the type. And there's some rules around how these are composed together uh, into a unified uh, schema uh, made up of all of these subparts. So rather than going on and making something bespoke uh, in the last month, you know, I've, I've kind of taken a, taken a left turn and said, well, you know, there's a industry standard way that is being well received that is very well thought out. So let's do that instead. Uh, so that in a nutshell is where we are um, with this graph project. Um, so in the next week or so, I'm, I'm working on docs and getting an MVP of this working. Um, we already have, I, I should say, an, MV, an MVP of this compositional model working. Um, so that's that. Very cool. Yeah. The rest of the agenda, though, is open. And, I, and if I seem like I blew through that <laughs> quickly, I, think, I, I think, don't want to waste uh, five minutes. <laughs> Matt, I wanted to, uh, again, you know, first of all, um, enable everybody to, you know, kind of output items that they wanted to discuss, but also wanted to look at uh, and revisit um, our observability projects under CNCF to see uh, if we can shortlist some of the projects we can reach out to for, you know, reviews. Um, and I did share a link for the landscape graph. Again, there's a card form also that we could look at, but, um, would like to kind of go through at least the list, you know, CNCF project list and see uh, if we can actually shortlist and, and reach out to some of the projects. I mean, we work closely with many of these projects and uh, just to get an update, you know, would be a good thing. So uh, Henrik or Ryan or Kevin, do you have any other topics you wanted to cover today? Um, for me, uh, it's just, um, I'm trying to, I started this open source news initiative. Yeah. Uh, I've been, been a bit, bit, been, been uh, a bit, uh, busy with, the uh, content and other stuff. So I, I didn't have, uh, I, I still have the storyboard open, but I didn't have the right bandwidth to, uh, to record and, and produce everything, but it's still, it's still in my, um, uh, I didn't, um, are there topics that you are looking for, um, you know, uh, to cover, uh, because then we could, you know, get the word out in terms of um, topics that that you would like to, you know, see more uh, focus on. Uh, I had a couple of what I usually do. I, I um, because I uh, we work closely with Michael on this one, so I, yes. I usually go uh, start with uh, what he has uh, identified in his open source news. Mm -hmm. And from there, I look at it. I try to, usually he, he selects blogs and stuff. So I try to, I have a section where I put the blogs and the books at the end. So I select a few, a few links there. But then I try to identify projects that, that are interesting um, or um, updates on projects that are interesting. Either it's open telemetry or anything. Something that deserves to be shared uh, yeah. with our community. I mean, uh, I think now, one of the uh, other of areas... Henrik, uh, that I was thinking that might be very useful and maybe Kevin can also provide us some input here. Uh, and I'll reach out to other folks in the Kubernetes community is actually to highlight on some of the integrations that the Kubernetes project is building out of the box for observability. 
and uh, you know again uh, kind of focus in on uh, more how to's in that area because if you look at the documentation on the project it's not very uh, detailed for observability specifically and i think i'd love to see more um, you, uh, do you have a link to that yeah yeah i can i can sh share a link let me just share just link. But, notes too yeah please yep. do yeah, because the open source news is, is, is the main objective is to share updates as so people is aware and spreading the, the news for everyone. Uh, the is it observable is more on the tutorial side. So for example, now I just uh, recorded and I'm starting the post-production. I do um, a deep dive on the collector and, uh, and I'm, I'm using an example saying, hey, can we uh, fully observe Kubernetes using only the collector? Uh, so then that's an excuse to, uh, to present few receivers uh, that has been uh, uh, built by the community for Kubernetes. So Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes kubelets, uh, there is a couple of them like this. So I think that that was an excuse for me to explain how you build a pipeline and also introduce few interesting receivers, processor, whatever, uh, to our audience and provide tutorials to that. So. Again, uh, the news is more to share updates and, and projects and whatever it is. And is it observable is more on the tutorial side. Cool, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, again, as a general topic, I think it would be useful to um, just, you know, kind of look at it uh, even from a documentation point of view, because uh, as you know, even on the hotel side, there's a significant project that has been ongoing in recent weeks on uh, improving the documentation and integrating it under opentelemetry.io. So um, again, you know, that's something just continuing to improve the documentation on major projects uh, is a, a, I'd love to see more um, contributions to it, especially on the <laughs> Kubernetes side. So maybe that's an area where we could perhaps uh, invite some of the Kubernetes contributors also to chat. Yeah, about. And feel free to drop me a message or an email if, like, on the um, collector in Kubernetes, because like that's what mostly what my team does. So if you're more curious about, like, uh, with growing node count, how to handle that, or like how we handle that, I'm, I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, it. Kevin, that would be awesome because I think that you know it's very valuable for, uh, especially end user groups, you know, and teams to actually kind of have those how to's because I've seen teams yeah. now, you know, really trying to figure out how to do, you know, what's the right configuration, what's the right, uh, or, or what are optimal, you know, uh, um, use cases that, that are, that work versus the other ones, which are kind of, okay, if we <laughs> still in development. Yeah. And also like, did, do you run one agent per cluster, uh, one collective exactly. cluster or per namespace or per yes. node or, yeah. And then, you know, especially the area where uh, for configuration, like are you using sidecars versus, uh, you know, operators and stateful sets and, and really, you know, having configurations uh, and pros and cons of each, right? Because they are, again, scalability considerations that you would have otherwise. So um, again, Kevin, if there are topics that, you know, your team could cover, that would be pretty awesome. And then perhaps we can get other contributors who are also working on hotel like David Ashpole and others to you know uh, maybe dive into some of the other areas but I like Hendrik's um, you know approach of taking the collector to kind of deep dive and walk through that for the different um, telemetry types but um, there's obviously you know more ways of doing this right so there's um, the Prometheus agent and other types of agents which also are used today. Uh, Alita, could you briefly, or or Steve she is now here too, or, or anybody else from that, that knows? Uh, you had made reference to the Kubernetes project putting in. Some... Yeah, I, I'm just giving you the uh, link just now. So oh yeah, you know. I was gonna say if you want to for the video, just even talk for like 30 seconds or in broad strokes about like what they're doing in a nutshell. Um, um, uh, it's like further on the whole metric server evolution. Um, I think I think maybe Kevin, do you want to just uh, uh, do you have 
uh, could you share five minutes on an update on Kubernetes on the Kubernetes side? Otherwise, um, um, I, I can get David to come and share. No, yeah, I, I haven't been in the uh, second implementation for a while. I'm looking forward to this week. Um, so I, I, I'm not familiar on all the topics they are working on. I only know that we, like my team is also catching up on metric server and seeing what needs contributing there and the scalability issues we have with it. But aside yes. from that, um, like the metric server is one of these examples, like the same as running one collector per cluster. If you run one, like it, it's a it's a single thing component, it, it can't scale other than vertically. And the more nodes you add and the more pods and resources you add at some point, it like use 60 gigabytes of memory. And, and that's not fun if your node's only 50 gigabytes of memory. So um, it's a it's a general issue and I don't know, we, we need to work with the instrumentation to find out if we can do something about it or if metric service just maybe not meant for bigger clusters and you need other solutions at that point, but it's a discussion to be had. Yes, and then I think I would just like to add to that that SIG instrumentation is the group in the Kubernetes project, which is you know looking at observability, and and um, I think that um, I'll take an action item to reach out and invite them to kind of come and talk about the state of integration right now because I know that tracing is fully supported with Open Telemetry. Um, that integration has been ongoing for a while. Um, and, and of course, metrics is, uh, you know, by default supported by the Prometheus uh, agent today, but would love to see, you know, more integration with Hotel as the metrics, uh, you know, implementation stabilizes on Hotel. And then of course, logs uh, has a different, uh, you know, integration today. So the, um, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Uh, the tracing question in Kubernetes, I find, uh, I, I first I heard about it or like looked at it was a few years ago and when, when the whole thing adding tracing to Kubernetes started. And I find an interesting difference because right now tracing is very focused on requests and, and events and like tracing them in a distributed system. And Kubernetes is like, I, one challenge I observed was tracing Kubernetes works a bit, like it, it's hard because you, we have requests, you can trace those, but most of the important things happening are like asynchronous processes and it's very hard to connect. And I know there was a huge discussion of like, how do you trace the life cycle of an object through Kubernetes? So like an operator, I, I've worked on a project before we, where we, I think tried to add tracing to an operator or maybe did. And it's like, it's a loop. There is no request. So you, you need to export a trace for every loop and every run of the loop and that can give you interesting data, but it's counterintuitive to what tracing is yes. known for right now. Agreed. So, I mean, there, there are exactly those nuances that I think um, uh, are well worth, you know, kind of looking at on a regular basis because it's an environment, production environment, you know, that everybody is using. And then um, again, as a baseline, would be yeah. good to kind of track on the, on the tag group. To kind of tack on to, oh, oh sorry. No, and, and like also the cost of tracing is still unclear to most people. I think it was the same it's, to me. Like we added tracing, and yeah, no, totally agree with you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think if I'm not mistaken, you're referring to the Kubernetes API server having been instrumented for yes. uh, span. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I concur, and I just had two two brief things to talk on. Alalita, uh, you mentioned that we'd reach out to SIG instrumentation uh, last yeah. summer, I believe, when uh, a new tech lead uh, was voted in. Yes. Uh, I reached out, uh, you know, with my tag hat on uh, and kind of like formally said, hey, SIG instrumentation, we're tag observability, we'd love to talk with you and blah, blah, blah. We had a meeting uh, and we identified some things that might make sense to work on, uh, some of which we're talking about here. So for what okay, it's worth, cool. uh, there's, there's, there's the, 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 um, I just said the landing field has been like we've already kind of uh, softened the ground there um, and made initial contact, but it's it's absolutely a couple quarters later time for a follow up. Yeah, um, I think so because I think there are areas that you know are continuing to evolve, right? And and in terms of yeah. stability and functionality, and I think that that integration should continue to you know keep occurring, and it's as good as folks contributing to and, that project. 
Yeah, and then, and then the second thing, absolutely, the second thing, uh, Kevin, what you're saying around operators in particular being hard to understand uh, by looking at the signals we have today, uh, I actually couldn't agree more, and I've done some thinking around this. Uh, and just it, it, in short, like, you know, you know, the, the logs approach that we all kind of grew up with, and many of us did, where everything is fine until it's very much not, <laughs> you know, that doesn't really <laughs> help you with operators, right, which might try end times be failing until they don't, and then that's a success, right? So logs are less than helpful. Um, same thing with traces and even, and even metrics can provide an insight, but not much more. Um, I yeah. think what, what would provide that insight though is actually um, something that I've kind of been incubating for about half a year. And this landscape graph project is really mm -hmm. just in a short term useful way to get hands dirty with a tech stack to address this deeper problem of how do we form a system of record for Kubernetes that's more useful and accessible than the audit log from the API server. Um, and, and, but, but more fundamentally, how do we understand the behavior of in particular operators and other Kubernetes workloads that don't follow a, a traditional, you know, either single threaded or everything is fine until it blows up kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, and just in a nutshell, if you have a shared dynamic informer that's listening for all creates, updates and deletes, to all resources or resources that you care about, Kubernetes resources, uh, and you throw them into um, a graph database uh, that keeps prior versions of them in a linked list. So you can think of every Kubernetes resource has a linked list. The head of that linked list is the current state. And the, as, the, as you traverse this list, you have prior states back in time. Uh, if you do that, plus link everything together, um, you know, objects that refer to other objects like deployments and replica sets or, or, or CRDs or whatever, you then kind of have a model that you can interrogate to understand like what's connected to what versus having to, you know, Kube Kittle get this, Kube Kittle get that and make the connections in your wetware. Um, and, the, and the last kind of thing that I've been looking at is the, the interplay between OpenAPI and GraphQL. So IBM has a project that can take an arbitrary um, GraphQL endpoint and generate an open API spec. Uh, it it kind of works. It's actually possible to go the other way too. So in theory, we could take the open API spec from Kubernetes, right? For, from all these, for, for all the, the baked in Kubernetes types, but more interestingly for all of the CRDs too, uh, you know, that, that all these operators are using across the landscape. Um, and, you know, you could greatly accelerate creating a GraphQL model you know, to, to, to define the schema for that graph database. And, and because the open API uh, surface knows the connections between things and their types and everything, you know, you have a, a really quick way to build a model that, that could consume this data and then provide it back with some insights. So I'd love to chat more maybe in a different meeting and I don't want yeah, to I, more time I, than I have here, but, but I think there's legs here in that, it, in that it, overall it, approach. Mm -hmm. It's fun that you mentioned this because I, I worked on something like that as a fun project, putting Kubernetes events and stuff into the graph I was using, uh, which was very fun. Uh, and yeah, um, the audit log, huge improvement. Um, I'm, it's, it's one of my most accessed logs, I think, these days, because it kind of gives you a graph if you yeah. know what you're searching for. But yeah, uh, and, and I, I, I think it was like four years ago. I, I played with a D graph for a while and, and, and tried that too. And yeah, it would, that would be interesting. Um, and if you could enrich it then with like, if operators do tracing or whatever, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. The other interesting thing about that data model is that it, the intersections, be, you know, the vertices in that connected graph that is the state of Kubernetes, um, that's a nice place to aggregate metrics very efficiently, right? You can, you can do yeah. various graph, graph walks. In Neo4j in particular, you have the ability to very quickly filter by node types or node labels. So like, if you want to know the current state of something, boom. And then I think it's in previous notes. I'm just scrolling down for a picture. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you need to make a useful tool is to very quickly be able to get time spans uh, without having to traverse all of these linked lists linearly. And so if you build a structure kind of like this into the graph, um, Actually, two of them is what I hypothesize would be nice. One, based on wall clock time like this that goes down to seconds and microseconds, but you could think of Kubernetes resource number, which is monotonically increasing, as another time domain. So you could build a similar time-based index on Kubernetes resource revisions or Kubernetes resource version 
revision number, you know what I mean? <laughs> the big long numbers. Um, that's a time yeah. domain as well. So. All right. So I think I think uh, again, just uh, I think we have some action items. I did add the links in, Matt, for oh, thank you. the SIG instrumentation. But uh, again, I, I will also follow up with the SIG uh, and and invite a couple of the engineers to come and speak. Um, yeah, and the uh, sorry, well, go ahead, Kevin. Can I, one quick note on on the SIG instrumentation. Um, again, I, I I need to join in more again. But my state also was especially for like metric server and stuff. Yeah, cool, there cool. is a That's... proper there's a proper lack of um, resources. Mm -hmm. I suppose here's the same. So if the CNCF tag has like, it, I think it would be beneficial to everybody to yep. make observability like advertising more. Like people, a lot of people don't see it as as important as it is, and that's why like stuff like second instrumentation is struggling with. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Totally it's, it's not it's not the fanciest of things to do, but it's actually one of the more important, most important things to do. And it is very useful for sure. As a CNCF, we managed to to share that with the community and and advertise it a little more and make it more attractive. I think we'd all be better off. Yes, I totally agree. And I think that that's really an area where uh, it really benefits, you know, uh, everyone in the in the larger ecosystem who's using Kubernetes in any way, shape or form to continue to increase and, and uh, integrate observability out of the box with, with the APIs that, that, that are developing, right? So totally, uh, I think we have Ryan here, Ryan just joined in. So hi Ryan, did you wanna give a quick update on profiling and, and uh, uh, just you know kind of some of the areas that you're blocked on? Yeah, sure. Um, sorry if there's noise in the background. I'm at an airport right now, but um, <laughs> but yeah, basically the uh, yeah we've we've gotten a good some good momentum going. I mean, I would say we probably have an average of like you know 15 to 20 people who show up at at the meetings. Um, we moved the meetings to biweekly. I mean, bi monthly. Sorry. Uh, so every other week. But um, but yeah, we've heard from let's see from Pixie. Uh, Pyroscope, um, uh, basically uh, Elastic, uh, Datadog, basically a bunch of different, um, you know, profiling mm -hmm. companies who are doing some sort of custom format and uh, sort of what is custom about their format, why it's custom, and then also from uh, the Google PProf folks, and then um, some some people from Datadog talked about JFR. And so basically we've heard about a bunch of different kinds of formats. And so now we're starting to sort of transition into, okay, now that we know sort of a taxonomy of all the different formats that are out there, what is, you know, how do we start moving towards a standardized format that's sort of supported by OTEL? And, um, and so, yeah, so as we're moving towards that, the next uh, sort of biggest things that we have to figure out are, um, one benchmarking. So we're starting to think about how can we better, um, you know, benchmark these things. So we have a lot of like qualitative data about which, you know, formats are, um, you know, out there and the pros and cons of them, but we don't have a lot of quantitative data as to, um, you know, yeah, like how they compare both, you know, on the wire and just the, you know, the format itself. And then, um, so that's on one side. The other side is uh, we're also trying to better um, sort of flush out like what the actual benefit of a standardized format is. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of people are there kind of just to have a pulse on what direction this is moving, but I don't think necessarily everybody is convinced that a standardized format is actually net beneficial for you know, vendors and users and, you know, hotel in general, so on and so forth. And so I think um, that's another area where this group might be useful in, um, you know, sort of helping convey where those benefits are and, and why it should be, you know, a, uh, an effort that, that continues to move forward. So um, those are the biggest things. And then I guess another small thing is just that we need, we have one TC member who's on board, but I think Per the uh, kind of hotel like rules or guidelines, we need two. So um, we also need to uh, convince another uh, hotel TC member to jump on board and help out, basically. 
Okay, Ryan, that's that's a good. Uh, thank you again for a very comprehensive summary. I think that um, again, the CNCF tag definitely can. Uh, this group can definitely help in uh, having more of the cross-project conversations. You know, as is to the value of having an uniform <laughs> protocol for profiling, but uh, also uh, perhaps looking in a more in depth about semantic conventions that are uh, common to um, be able to be used, you know, for each of these specific types of profiling, right? So um, I think having a common format is always beneficial for the end user. <laughs> it's just consistency and scalability uh, that, that, that at the end of the day are winners. Um, but that's yeah, I think the I think the biggest headwind there is the, like, I, I think the vendors have been generally supportive of the idea, but, you know, there's always going to be like, well, we do it this way. What's the benefit for us to switch to this other standardized format when we've already, you know, invested resources and so on in, you know, format X, why should we switch to format Y? Um, and, you know, obviously it's, you know, happened with logs and metrics and traces so far. So, um, you know, so there's some precedent there that I think we can also rely on, but, uh, but I think it's just a matter of sort of, you know, conveying that it, you know, I, I mean, personally, I think just the general sort of promotion of profiling at itself as just, you know, as a signal type would be beneficial for everyone. Um, and if it takes a standardized format to do that, I think it would probably be, you know, again, like net positive in that sense. But I think there's also benefits as well as being able to, you know, support multiple languages more easier and that kind of stuff. But uh, I think it's just a matter of getting those kinds of messages from, you know, more places. So companies who are thinking about profiling, who are willing to say like, yeah, it would be much nicer to adopt this if all of our stuff was going to be in the same format or, you know, like st stuff along those lines, if that makes sense. Agreed, agreed, totally. And, and um, again, to that point, I think there's more work to be done there. And um, do you think it would be useful to kind of pull in the, you know, different projects who have done their own implementations, like Pixie has presented, you know, at the tag before, uh, but some of the other projects, but like Periscope and others too also kind of do a deep dive and I mean, I'm sure they've yeah. done their presentations at the profiles uh, SIG, but um, also, you know, kind of at, in a larger, on a larger audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, having a larger audience would definitely help in that sense. Um, yeah, that's definitely something we could do moving forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the bigger side is, yeah, like the use i think the the sides that we haven't heard from as much are the users who would be actually you know implementing profiling in their project and you know adding profiling to their you know to their company stack and then you know also a little bit of the the languages themselves i think that might also be kind of a tricky one so um people from the java community or the like you know golang which already does you know kind of supports pprof natively Yep. You know, if Golang had to switch to some other format, I imagine the language maintainers themselves would probably have, you know, some thoughts there. And so it's a matter of kind of, you know, hopefully finding some way to get connected with people from those communities who would be able to speak to, um, you know, how much of an appetite they have for, you know, changing the way that they've been doing things as well. So I think those are the two biggest groups that we haven't heard from that it would be nice to have input from. Um, and yeah, hopefully people from this group could, you know, potentially connect us with people from those, uh, you know, the totally. right people in those communities. No, Ryan, I mean, that's a great point because I see a lot of similarities with, you know, the discussions and the work that has been ongoing in the logging, uh, SIG and the logging, uh, you know, uh, implementation per language, right? Because again, uh, some languages, you know, come with logging out of the box, like Java, um, or Python, and then there are others, you know, who've kind of built a layer for observability on top, right? So um, definitely profiling is also very similar in, in that respect. 
uh, and given that you know some of it also uses logging under the hood, uh, but but nonetheless that those discussions are important and and um, uh, again let's discuss further on Slack perhaps the, to kind of figure out how we can actually invite some of the language communities as well as the um, some of the end users who are using and uh, instrumenting profiling. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I said I, I'm also interested in the, in the collecting, collecting, collecting profiles, both in the language and getting it out yep. of the application. Yep. Also, again, mainly because I, I nice question. I last week did that with a component and was um, fascinated, or like looking into what makes it so much more, again, memory expensive to collect profiles and if we can do something about it or... Um, totally. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Because, I mean, instrumentation is the first part. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. And, and I think that's, that's one of the biggest things too, is that, you know, one thing that we've seen as we've talked to some people is that, you know, profiling can really tie a lot of the other signals together. You know, for example, with profiling, you know how expensive it is to add tracing and logging and metrics. You know, you have like a collective sort of overview of each one of those, like instrumenting it themselves. I think you had um, mentioned that earlier that you were kind of, uh, you know, like each one of instrumenting it itself has its own overhead. And so you're able to kind of understand that with profiling. And we also want to kind of move forward this idea of like linking everything together sort of natively. And with Otel, um, you know, it's a lot easier to already, you know, like the, the sort of foundation is there to be able to link it together. And so it's just a matter of kind of tying everything together, sort of like conveying the story in a cohesive way mm -hmm. and, um, and sort of getting some, uh, some momentum behind it. Um, one other thing that I will mention too, is that, yeah, with, with logging, um, I think it was either logging and either and or metrics that. I think kind of it ended up working sort of against the standardization effort that those signals waited too long to try to standardize thing because then by that point, I think it was like um, like .NET or somebody had already sort of, you know, their own way of doing metrics or, you know, logging or stuff. And I think profiling is at a great spot where, you know, it's, you know, sort of rising in popularity and also it, you know, it, it, it's young enough that, you know, before people get too entrenched in specific, you know, siloed ways of doing it, we could, um, you know, hopefully agree on a standard early on. And so I think that's also a big uh, yeah, benefit totally, of, totally of agree. approaching it now. Yeah, Ryan, I mean, I totally agree with that statement because I, I do think that, you know, again, there's a lot more implementations and usage in metrics and logging, which have kind of you know, they are um, ad hoc standards, if you will, and, and hence, you know, that influences when you're trying to make a, a new standard consistent, right? So in profiling, uh, I think the, uh, the field is still greenfield. <laughs> so uh, definitely uh, a much higher chance of, of being consistent at the protocol level. So uh, a good, good, good points to raise. Um, There's also an interesting point in like, teaching people when to do profiling or like, yeah, like when, if you want to do it all the time, which is expensive, I added, uh, I never profiling in the hotel collector uh, to find out why exploring some metrics is so expensive. And all of a sudden exploring profiles was more expensive than exploring metrics, which was kind of funny. Um, so also that like do traces and metrics and profiling and logging, like how do you balance it? When do you do what in what, when observing and debugging a, a text stack kind of? Yep, agreed, agreed. And, and I think that that discussion is typically, um, uh, you know, not had. Uh, and, and actually there are several, you know, teams that are looking at it from different vendors as well as on the projects themselves. So um, actually, having a more uh, focused discussion around when when is profiling needed and what what are the use cases today versus you know what long term can be done with profiling is is a good discussion also to be had um if you can outline kevin some of the folks or you know again all of us collectively can do this um you know just pull in some of the folks maybe we can have a discussion in one of the um tag meetings on, on that specifically. 
w one thing that I've noticed is that the meetings have been really good in that, you know, so far it's been a series of show and tells of various profilers and their formats. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, for example, you know, the Pixie folks, the PProc folks went into significant substantive detail about some of their choices. But uh, while we've broached the subject in Slack, I think in terms of like what it, that question of like, what's the utility of having a standard? Um, it's a bit, the discussion's a little muddy or conflated at, at present, right? Between the data format and the wire protocol. And, and if you look at scenarios as it relates to the wire protocol, there's a couple of really uh, important things that I don't think it's useful to like hammer out consensus on, you know, that, that, that being push versus pull. Another one is stateful versus stateless, right? So like, is every request of the transport gonna like have duplicate data, right? So that it's a stateless uh, request or a stateless packet that stands alone, but then you've got duplicative overhead, right? There, there's different times where you might wanna do different things or, or similarly, if we think about when profiles come in, there's probably like a parsing step, right? To go from whatever format to whatever kind of superset data model we have, right? But then there's subsequent, you know, compression, deduplication. There's, there's these different transforms that can be applied, right? And, and for some of those, you might want to do the compute expensive part of that processing at the point of collection. Like if you, you know, some people might want to do that because then you don't have to shovel the data or maybe it stays there in sort of a, an effective ring buffer that with timing out data after a month or so or, or a couple of weeks or even a day, you know, all the way to the other side where, you know, you might be collecting from edge devices that have very limited compute and you want to as efficiently as possible, just get bits off the device and, and actually spend no time doing anything else, you know, deferring all post-processing to the back end or, or somewhere in between. And one of my concerns is that we have this really good group of people coming together in, you know, with, with good intent and it's really a model for open source collaboration. But I think if that group tries to force like one size fits all, um, we risk fragmentation and then making things worse, not, not better. So, so I, I'm eager to, to get to those more focused discussions, perhaps that start with a pre-read or an agenda uh, and, and, and are a smaller set of folks that are really interested in this, but I see a lot of potential, but, you know, again, so, so, some potential for-, for, for I think uh, uh, the other way to look at this also is, you know, how do we, even if there are evolving uh, implementations or evolving, you know, optimized protocols that are being developed by different um, projects, um, interoperability is one of the ways of addressing that, right? And, and it's not that you have to have an exact uh, set, but it's again, also interop uh, and, and kind of looking at it from both perspectives, because if there is a specific implementation that's optimized for a specific type of profiling uh, and, and data that is, you know, really um, uh, being collected, you know, for, um, that specific, you know, type, then maybe it should exist. And there's a transformation that you are applying at the data protocol level that ensures that interoperability and hence the consistency back to the end user, right? But yeah. uh, it, it, it's it's really the you know that discussion to be had, Ryan. I mean, uh, what have have some of those discussions come about? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think right now the biggest focus, yeah, I, I mean, I think those are all great points. I mean, right now the biggest focus, because because even the custom formats that exist are sort of, you know, uh, effectively forks of like pre-existing yeah. formats, you know? Yes. And so it's a matter of kind of finding that lowest common denominator that, you know, can get as close to, you know, the things that are common between all of those, which we've started to identify that there are certain things um that are that tend to be common um that that people are typically looking for sort of like fleet fleet wide continuous profiling um sort of like low overhead um the ability for tags is something that or labels is something that has been sort of like emerged as something that is commonly you know every custom format had some way of labeling data whether that was data for like symbolization type of stuff or, you know, like traditional labels like you have with like, you know, traces, you know, pod name, namespace, you know, that kind of stuff. 
Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we've definitely had a lot of those conversations. I think the main focus right now is coming up with a sort of format or protocol that will sort of support both push and pull, and it will support both stateful and state, you know, that you could somehow like send stateful or stateless data through the same sort of message format that there's sort of like a field that will be able to like accommodate all of that stuff. And then that way, you know, people can sort of use whatever, um, you know, whatever, yeah, you know, whatever they've kind of built. And it's just a matter of sort of like expanding, you know, sort of the existing formats in a way that will support, you know, all the different people's use case. And so that's kind of where the conversation is now. Um, but uh yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of where the conversation is now. And I think that there's generally a consensus there, which is why we're sort of moving to the benchmarking stage to um, at least benchmark sort of, yeah, you know, um, some of the, you know, sort of, yeah, like quantitative metrics that will come with, you know, if you, if you do add room, for example, to encode labels or something like that, like, how do you do it in a way that's, you know, efficient and low overhead and that kind of stuff. And so I think that's sort of, um, you know, regardless of which direction we go, that's something that we'll need. And then figuring out the, you know, wire format and that kind of stuff will yep. um, sort of come after that. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. And, and uh, again, I think we have some action items though here and, and some good topics. So uh, Matt, yeah. maybe we can kind of follow up on, yeah. Some of these, I have two action items. I'll definitely reach out to the SIG instrumentation yep. group from K, uh, Kubernetes and uh, get some of the folks also to join in. Uh, yep. And then on the profiling side, uh, Ryan, I'll follow up with the um, TC uh, yeah. to see if uh, you know there's another TC member who can join in. One yes, so far it's uh it's Tigran has been the one okay. who has been uh you know attending some meetings so far. Um Good. and Tigran is, is awesome. Yeah, again, he, I think and, and he's very spread thin though. So I want to make yes. sure we don't overload Tigran because I know he does everything basically. So uh exactly. it would be nice to get somebody else in there too. There, there was one other idea out of the last meeting that I thought was interesting enough and, and I could briefly uh, mention it just to put it in people's heads, but um, you know, again, in, in, if 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 we assume that it's possible to cleave, and I think it is, you know, what is the the data model that is really what a, a standard would be, uh, and then you know, a protocol or protocols that are sort of the transport layer to to, to move that data wherever it needs to be. Like, if we do have that kind of coupling, uh, decoupling rather, you could almost think of as a as a thought experiment, you know because so many profiles, uh, you know, they're looked at after the fact, you know, you don't really need real time profiles. So you can almost think of like, what would it look like if there was a global data model for all profiles on earth? You know, what, what does that namespacing look like? Uh, and, you know, if, if you agree on a data model, and if you agree about how individual profile samples or reports can fit into that sort of global, I mean, like planet earth global, you know, you know, then, and you assume that thing, it's okay if things are eventually consistent, then suddenly like the specifics of a wire protocol are less important than the description of the data that that protocol would move. Because for example, there's all kinds of ways to move data. Uh, and you know, you could use a distributed key value store like TIKV. It's obviously not optimized, but like there are ways where you could like not have to make OTEL define an actual down to the bit protocol and still move data where it needs to be. Or maybe the data resides there, but it needs to be sharded out, you know, because you don't want to move all this data. You want to leave it there, but have it in a different database or a different way to a different back end, right? So um, I, I, I'm not sure if that's a crazy idea or not, but but that's what's been in my in my brain coming out of the last profiling meeting. Is like, what would that global data model look like? Um, because if we could agree there, it's easier to agree to that, you know, yep. across all these concerns. Uh, and then it, and then it, it kind of, it forces a discussion of, it, it forces treating the transport layer as just that, just a way to shovel bits. And there's different scenarios that are needed there, right? So I think, I, I don't know, do, do others think this similar? I, thing or, I think, I think there's a discussion to be had there, Matt. Um, again, yeah. 
uh, building a global spec also, you know, means that it influences in implementation. So I think that's where the, uh, 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 that's why, you know, there's a fair bit of deliberation on this. Oh, I, I didn't mean like right. a, I just meant as a thought experiment. I was also right, right. As an experiment. How, how we open yes. metrics, right? Agreed. Open metrics defines just the data format. It doesn't. Agreed. Yeah. Right. Yep. I think, I think though today we are at time or a little bit about, so. Uh, good discussion and we have some action items. So Ryan, thank you for joining in. Kevin, Henrik, uh, Steve, Ryan, <laughs> thanks. Feel free to chat me up, send me email. Uh, will do, yeah. yeah. All right, right. will do, thank you. Thank you, bye, bye, thanks, Matt. Yep. Right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody.